Welcome back to the Statdose podcast. We're here doing another turbo dose. Today we're talking about overdoses. Yeah, so we're, we're talking about overdoses today because there's actually one of the simulations that we run and uh, and it's good, good to have a standardised approach actually because overdoses are really, really common. <laughs> can range from your very very common over-the-counter paracetamol aspirin dose where there's a conscious and quite often asymptomatic patient right the way through to your your sort of shocked extremist patient who's low GCS and, and really really sick so, so history is as you know as, as quite commonly um, is the really important factor here a clear history involves obviously ascertaining what drug has been taken Often this can be multiple drugs. How much of the drug? Where the drug was taken? So some people, you know, do inject injection-based overdoses. Some people do oral overdoses, which would be the most common. And and what time? Some overdoses that will present delayed. Some <coughs> overdoses will actually be staggered overdoses, and and some will just be kind of taking them as a singular. So what time you took them as well? So some some will overdoses will present having taken a, a significant bolus of of an overdose at once. Some, however, may take uh, staggered overdoses and some, some may, may do it over a couple of days. So it's really important to understand how long. On top of the, the drugs that have been taken, you want to think about co ingestants as well. So quite commonly in the setting of, let's say, for example, a uh, intent to self-harm, you know, they'll take this alongside some alcohol. Um, and obviously that has ramifications for how this is um, absorbed into the body um, and actually how accurate the history is going to be. And then after you've really ascertained what's going on you want to then get a history as to what the clinical state has been since then so have they been asymptomatic or have they um, gained some symptoms and from when did they have those symptoms now obviously in unconscious patients this is not going to be possible but what, what we want to try and then do is find some evidence of the um, medication, so empty pill packets in the pockets, um, relatives that have brought things in, uh, try and gain that history either from the patient or from somebody who has brought that patient in. Asking a medication history and, and then making a risk assessment of what's the worst thing that this patient could have taken from their medication history. So if they've taken, if they're on omeprazole and venlafaxine then the obvious thing here is that the overdose of omeprazole isn't going to be the, the worst case scenario and actually an overdose on venlafaxine is going to be more difficult for them. So thinking about risk management from there. Obviously, mental health is a big thing here. So we really want to be thinking about the risk of um, patients absconding once we've uh, managed that. And so many, many of these patients are actually in crisis. So, so actually questioning in an empathic way that's not inflammatory, um, you know, is really important here and, and showing some understanding. So Matt, that's the history. I mean, what, what, what are you actually looking for if you're doing a contemporaneous assessment on this individual? What, what are you looking for? As you say, a lot, a lot of our overdose patients, they're nice and alert and they can just say, yeah, I've taken you know, 20 paracetamol at, uh, at this time. And, but there's a subset of our, of our patients who are unconscious and you can't get a history from. All the history that you do get is unreliable. Uh, often a lot of these patients come from very, very chaotic lifestyles. And if you've got, and as, as you mentioned, there's lots of alcohol often co-ingested with overdoses. So if you've got a drunk patient with a low GCS and a, and a, a relative or a family member who's also intoxicated, you're going to be unsure as how how accurate that history is, how reliable that history is. So we often have to work backwards looking at the, the toxidrome. So we essentially assess our patient, work out what features they have, and then, as you, as you say, go backwards and, and work out what the likely drug that's causing that is. So there's quite a few. I think we'll just, just go through some of the key points for a lot of them there. So, so opioids, obviously a very common drug to overdose on morphine, codeine, um, methadone, heroin, consider your, your, your patches as well, your fentanyl patches. But we're going to see a low GCS, so a degree of sedation. We're going to see a low respiratory rate. We'll often see a bit of bradycardia and a bit of hypotension as well. And they classically have pinpoint pupils. So when you're doing that, that A to E assessment, those are the features that you're looking for. Uh, you're going to give them naloxone or, or Narcan. Narcan is the brand name. It's a very safe drug in naloxone. So you can give lots of lots of that high doses. We normally recommend 400 micrograms IV, um, but it can be given IM as well. It's got a slower uptake when it's given IM. 
other toxidromes that we're interested in so that's like a sedative uh, toxidromes if you've taken often benzos alcohol they're going to have again a low gcs often a bit of slurred speech blurred vision hallucinations neurologically they may get some nice stagmas as well and they're often a bit atax and then you can see some sort of hallucinogenic toxidromes that's essentially where they have hallucinations unsurprisingly these patients are often quite agitated as well uh, they may be tachycardic breathing quickly, have hypertension, and they might seize. And we often see that with sort of amphetamines, cocaine, MDMA, ecstasy, all those sort of things can cause that hallucinogenic uh, type toxidrome. And then equally, those same drugs can cause what we call sympathomimetic toxidrome, where essentially they're exactly the same things. So they're tachycardic, hypertensive, they're sweating, they're agitated, dilated, big dilated pupils, both pupils are being dilated there. And then they get into the slightly, slightly more uncommon things. So the anticholinergic toxidrome, that's just going to give you purely anticholinergic features. So you're going to be tachycardic, you're going to be pyrexial, big pupils. You might be agitated, you might go into urinary retention as well. That's in with antihistamines, tricyclics, things like carbamazepine as well. And then on the flip side of that, the cholinergic uh, toxidrome is actually very rare. Organophosphate poisoning is the only thing that, that really causes that. You can get it in some some uh, mushrooms and some pesticides as well. I think we're all getting memories of, of Salisbury a couple of years ago. But that's where patients hypersalivate, they macromate a lot. So there's lots of stuff coming out of their tear ducts, diarrhea, vomiting, bronchospasm, discharging a lot from the nose. Uh, and they're often very bradycardic. Uh, and atropine is the, the go-to drug there, not in much higher doses that you would use for bradycardia. So we're often giving them two or three grams of atropine. Those are our key toxidromes that we that we need to be aware of. And it's just about looking up those features and, and trying to work backwards. Yeah, I think it I think it's important. It's quite difficult to to keep all that in your mind. I think it, it starts to get easier obviously when you sort of see this um in, in action. But I think a few of the things really there are, are looking at the patient's sort of conscious level, you know, and, and looking at what they what how they are presenting. So are they flat or are they agitated? You know, and then looking at things like pupils, are they are they pinpoint, are they dilated? Uh, looking at uh, vital signs, is it fast, is it slow? And you're kind of picking them out from there. So if you kind of put it into simplistic terms, you can start to get that toxidrome picture. Management of an overdose, um, you know, su super common. And, and, and as such, there is a, a dedicated um, guidance system for this called Toxbase. Um, and and um, I'd, I'd advocate going and having a look at that um, because it's, um, it is a really fantastic resource. They've got essentially guidance for all manners of weird and wonderful things that can be ingested, absorbed um, in, in whatever way and sort of what to do. And, and on top of that, the, the National Poisoning Centre is a very helpful resource. But in terms of the, the management initially, the advice is, is similar for all overdoses. So it's a, an A to E approach. You want to get an ECG and then you want to send off bloods. And Matt, what are we sort of looking for? The, the most important thing often is, is a gas. So if mm. they're um, if they're acidotic, it's a, a sign that they're unwell, but it's it's also a sign that they're going to get other sort of side effects or other effects from from the the drugs that they've overdosed on. So lots of patients, when they certainly when they're severely acidotic, are at risk of becoming shocked, having seizures, and that that therefore changes how you might approach that patient. So this is somebody you're going to want to be uh, assessing in a in more of a monitored area, so possibly like a recess type environment, or just keeping a closer eye on them. CK is a, a quite a common marker that we check in in lots of our overdoses. So that's Creatinine kinase is just a release from from muscles, essentially, as a, as a sign of, again, uh, shock and damage and suggest a risk of AKI. Um, and then you can check some drug levels. We don't actually check that many. So we only really check paracetamol, salicylate, and we can check alcohol levels. And then some sort of commonly uh, monitored drugs like lithium um, comes to mind. Some antiepileptics we can do levels for. So I think we can do carbamazepine levels. But generally, I think a lot of patients have this perception that they're going to come in we see it a lot when patients have their or claim to have their drink spiked and they sort of they come in and almost expect us to do some blood tests for the levels of everything. And actually, we, we don't. From a medical point of view, there's often very little point in actually working out what the positive substance was. The police often will do sort of extended panels. So they often take urine and blood tests for a whole host of things if there's been a crime committed. But from a medical point of view, if you've got a well patient, there's often not much point checking things like that. Other things to consider, I suppose, in, in terms of our management is uh, is activated charcoal. So that's given if the overdose has been taken within an hour. Um, it's very a very black substance, very sticky. 
you will recognise patients who have taken it because their teeth change colour is often all around their mouth and it often makes patients vomit and again a lot of a lot of practitioners think that that's the point is to make patients vomit and it's not it's it's about absorbing the the substances in in the stomach and preventing them from being absorbed the vomiting actually in in overdoses again we, you know you see it a lot in Hollywood don't you somebody would just suddenly grab some salt and uh, and a glass of water from a from a bathroom make themselves sick and everyone thinks that they're better actually if you vomit if you squeeze if you squeeze a tube essentially that's what you're doing when you're vomiting you're squeezing a very long tube half of the stuff will go in one direction half of it will go in the other direction so actually when you vomit post an overdose you are propelling half of that stuff you've taken into your small intestine so actually vomiting post overdose isn't particularly helpful so ignore hollywood again they've got it wrong that's what i base all my medicine on it's important that we, we monitor these patients for a certain period of time as well again you'll be guided by a talk space as to how long that is um, and once their period of monitoring is up they're medically fit and then we need to think significantly about their mental health and actually remembering the majority of these patients are in crisis and so they need to see somebody from a mental health team psychiatric liaison or, or another such uh, a service and ensure they've got the support that they need to try and prevent them overdosing or uh, deliberately self-harming again yeah i think that's really important as well and and, and alongside the sort of mental health um, liaison um, immediately within the hospital there are so many other ways in which you can kind of equip a patient you know social prescribing is becoming a, a, a huge thing this is an opportunity that you can have to just have a few numbers a few services in your back pocket you know after that crisis period so this is an opportunity for you to go that sort of step further and in, in doing sort of biopsychosocial care for your patients That's, that's essentially a bit, a bit of a, a rapid run through of um, assessment and management of overdoses. So in essence, what we're trying to put across here, guys, is taking a good history and learning about what, what exactly has happened with this overdose. Considering on your assessment whether there are any glaring toxic drains that are coming out at you that allow you to consider the management, looking this up on Toxbase and then doing a good sort of A to E approach, think about your investigations and importantly considering afterwards the sort of mental welfare of the patient and, and doing a, a proper biopsychosocial approach. <laughs>